and good day wherever you are. Welcome to Biblical Quests. We are a worldwide scripture study community seeking to fulfill Yah's commandment to his followers to meditate at night so that we may be like a tree planted by streams of water that gives its fruit in its season. So all that we do will prosper. This is week 49 of our 52 week cycle of chronological reading through the Torah, Prophets, and Yeshua's words. Reminding you that we are currently going through year one, which means that today the deep dive will be on the Torah portion. The reading and open discussion will explore several sources, in particular the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Septuagint, and the Hebrew-English Masoretic. Where relevant, we will also explore extra canonical books as found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. We are humbled and excited to share this journey with you all. Let us pray. Father Yah, we ask for your spirit to be upon us and all listening. May you give them ears to hear and eyes to see. And Father, whatever we speak, we pray that it is your will and that you provide clarity if anything was misspoken. And Father, may your spirit flow through us in sharing the insights that we have. And may it benefit the body of your children. May the rest of this reading be a blessing to your name. We ask in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so this is the schedule. It's a three-year cycle. Basically, every year the reading will go through the entire Torah, Prophets, and Yeshua's words, except the deep dives will be different. So in year one, we will deep dive through the Torah, year two through Prophets, and year three through Yeshua portion. This year, this week, we are on week 49. As you can see, we are going to read Deuteronomy chapter 23, 24, and 25, do a deep dive, discussions, and then finish with a short reading from the Dead Sea Scroll Thanksgiving hymns. Deuteronomy chapter 23. No man with crushed testicles or whose male organ is cut off may come into the assembly of Yahweh. And a legitimate child may not come into the assembly of Yahweh. Even to the tenth generation, none of his descendants may come into the assembly of Yahweh. An Ammonite or a Moabite may not come into the assembly of Yahweh. Even to the tenth generation, none of his descendants may come into the assembly of Yahweh forever. Because they did not come to meet you with food and with water when you came out of Egypt. And also because they hired Baal, son of Bear, from Pether, and Aram Naharim to act against you to curse you. But Yahweh your God was not willing to listen to Baal, and Yahweh your God turned the curse into a blessing for you. Because Yahweh your God loved you, you shall not promote their welfare or their prosperity all your days forever. You shall not abhor an Edomite, because he is your brother. You shall not abhor an Egyptian, because you were an alien in his land. The children that are born to them in the third generation may come representing them in the assembly of Yahweh. If you go out to encamp against your enemies, then you shall guard against doing anything evil. If there is among you a man that is not clean because of a seminal omission during the night, he shall go outside the camp. He shall not come within the camp. And then toward the coming of the evening, he shall bathe with water. And at the going down of the sun, he may come to the midst of the camp. And there shall be for you a designated place outside the camp, and you shall go there to relieve yourself. And a digging tool shall be included in addition to your other utensils for yourself. And then when you relieve yourself outside the camp, you shall dig with it. And then you shall turn, and you shall cover your excrement. For Yahweh your God is walking about in the midst of your camp to deliver you, and to hand your enemies over to you before you. And so let your camp be holy, so that he shall not see it at anything indecent, and he shall turn away from going with you. And you shall not hand over a slave to his master who has escaped and fled to you from his master. He shall reside with you in your midst in the place that he chooses in one of your towns wherever he pleases. You shall not oppress him. No woman of Israel shall be a temple prostitute, and no man of Israel shall be a male shrine prostitute. You may not bring the hire of a prostitute or the earnings of a male prostitute into the house of Yahweh your God for any vow offerings, because both are a detestable thing to Yahweh your God. You shall not charge your brother interest on money, interest on food, or interest on anything that one could lend on interest. You may lend on interest to the foreigner, but to your countrymen you may not lend on interest, so that Yahweh your God may bless you in all your undertakings in the land where you are going in order to take possession of it. 
When you make a vow to Yahweh your God, you shall not postpone fulfillment of it. For certainly Yahweh your God shall require it from you, and if postponed, you will incur guilt. And if you refrain from vowing, you shall not incur guilt. The utterance of your lips you must perform diligently, just as you have vowed freely to Yahweh your God, whatever it was that you promised with your mouth. When you come into the vineyard of your neighbor, then you may eat grapes as you please until you are full, but you shall not put any into your container. When you come into the standing grain of your neighbor, then you may pluck ears with your hand, but you may not swing a sickle among the standing grain of your neighbor. 23. Thoughts and insights. Okay, something interesting is that the in the Hebrew Bible, the first verse of chapter 23 apparently ended up as the last verse of chapter 22 in the English translation. So I would like to actually address this verse because it's very important and I'm going to read it to you. A man may not take the wife of his father and so he may not dishonor his father. In Hebrew, the literal translation is, so he shall not uncover the corner or wing of his father's garment. Similar ver verses to this are in Numbers 15.38 and 1 Samuel 15.27. So I really want to take the time and explore this expression of uncovering the corner of the father's garment referring basically to violating his wife or violating the married woman. So related verses of interest. Note that nakedness is used interchangeably with the sinning woman and also with the corner of the garment. So in different verses, you might read nakedness, you might read the sinning woman, which is the wife, or you might see the corner of the garment and all of those three mean the one and the same. So let's look at Deuteronomy 27.20. 20. Cursed be the one who lies with the wife of his father because he has dishonored his father's bed. That's in English. In Hebrew it says because he has uncovered the corner of his father's garment and all the people shall say Amen. Leviticus 18.7 You must not expose your father's nakedness or your mother's nakedness. She is your mother. You must not expose her nakedness. You must not expose the nakedness of your father's wife. It is your father's nakedness. Okay, so your father's wife is your father's nakedness. As for your sister naked, nakedness, whether your father's daughter or your mother's daughter, or whether born at home or born abroad, you must not expose their nakedness. As for the nakedness of your son's daughter or your daughter's daughter, you must not expose their nakedness because they are your nakedness. Okay? As for the nakedness of the daughter of your father's wife, she is your sister or a relative of your father, you must not expose her nakedness. And so on, it goes on and on, so I'm jumping to verse 16. You must not expose the nakedness of your brother's wife, she is your brother's nakedness. Okay, I have a point here that I'm going to get to, but notice how the nakedness of the wife is considered actually the nakedness of the husband. So whenever someone says the, that man's nakedness, it could actually mean the nakedness of the wife. Leviticus 20.11 As for a man who lies with his father's wife, he has exposed his father's nakedness. Both of them shall be put to death, their blood is on them. Leviticus 20.20 20. As for a man who lies with his aunt, he has exposed his uncle's nakedness. They shall bear their sin, they shall die childless. Now I want to get to a very important verse from Genesis chapter 9, 22-23. And Ham, the father of Canaan, 
saw the nakedness of his father. And by now you should know that most likely this is talking about the wife of his father. And he told his two brothers outside. Then Shem and Yefet and Jephet took a garment and the two of them put it on their shoulders and walking backward they covered the nakedness of their father which was most likely the nakedness of the wife of the father and their faces were turned backward so that they did not see the nakedness of their father and then i found a very interesting verse in ezekiel that is that ya is actually using the same terminology except he is using it toward jerusalem so ezekiel 16 6 through 8 and i yahweh passed by you jerusalem and I saw you kicking about in your blood, and I said to you in your blood, live, and I said to you in your blood, live, grow up, I will make you like a plant of the field, and you grew up, and you became tall, and reached full womanhood, your breasts were formed, and your hair had grown, but you were naked and bare, and I passed by you, and I saw you, and look, your time of lovemaking love making had come. And so I spread out my hem, or in Hebrew, the corner of my garment. Literally, that's what he says. I spread out my hem over you, and I covered your nakedness, and I swore to you, and I entered into a covenant with you, declare, declares the Lord Yahweh, and you became mine. So in Deuteronomy, I'm sorry, in Genesis chapter 35, 22, we read one verse, just one verse about one of the biggest abominable sexual interaction in the Bible. And this verse says, And while Israel, meaning Jacob, was living in that land, Reuben, went and had sexual relations with Bilha, his father's concubine. And Israel, Jacob, heard about it. That's it, just one verse. So I'm turning to the book of Jubilee. As you remember, we talked about it last week and I mentioned that there were 15 Jubilee scrolls that were found in five different caves among the Dead Sea Scrolls at Qumran. All scrolls were written in Hebrew. So here is a short excerpt, one verse in Genesis turns into more, uh, about I think 20 verses in Jubilee, so let's read. And Jacob went and dwelt to the south of Migdal Eder, and he went to his father Isaac, he and Leah his wife, on the new moon, actually in English it says new moon, but in Hebrew it says on the first day of the 10th month. And Reuben saw Bilha, Rachel's maid, the concubine of his father, bathing in water in a secret place, and he loved her. And he hid himself at night, and he entered the house of Bilha at night, and he found her sleeping alone on a bed in her house. And he lay with her, and she awoke, and saw, and behold, Reuben was lying with her in the bed. And he uncovered the border of her covering. In Hebrew, uncovered her nakedness. And seized him and cried out and discovered that it was Reuben. And she was ashamed because of him and released her hand from him and he fled. And she lamented because of this thing exceedingly and did not tell it to anyone. And when Jacob returned and sought her, she said unto him, I am not clean for thee, for I have been defiled as regards thee. For Reuben hath defiled me, and hath lain with me in the night, and I was asleep, and did not discover until he uncovered my nakedness. Okay, not scared, nakedness, and slept with me. And Jacob was exceedingly wroth with Reuben because he had lain with Bilha, because he had uncovered his father's skirt, uncovered the corner of his father's garment in Hebrew. 
And Jacob did not approach her again because Reuben had defiled her. And as for any man who uncovered his father's skirt or uncovered the corner of his father's garment, his deed is wicked exceedingly, for he is abominable before the Lord. For this re reason it is written and ordained on the heavenly tables that a man should not lie with his father's wife and should not uncover the corner of his father's garment. For this is unclean. They shall surely die together, the man who lied with his father's wife and the woman also, for they have wrought uncleanness on the earth. And there shall be nothing unclean before our God in the nation which he had chosen for himself as a possession. And again it is written a second time, Cursed he be who lied with the wife of his father, for he had uncovered his father's nakedness. And all the holy ones of the Lord said, So be it, so be it. And do thou, Moses, command the children of Israel that they observe this word for it entailed a punishment of death, and it is unclean, and there is no atonement forever to atone for the man who had committed this. But he is to be put to death and slain and stoned with stones and rooted out from the midst of the people of our God. For to no man who doeth so in Israel is it permitted to remain alive a single day on the earth, for he is abominable and unclean. And let them not say to Reuben was granted life and forgiveness after he had lain with his father's concubine, and to her also, though she had a husband, and her husband Jacob his father was still alive. For until that time there had not been revealed the ordinance and judgment and law in its completeness for all. But in thy days it had been revealed as a law of seasons and of days and an everlasting law for the everlasting generations. So basically Jubilees explained that this is an unforgivable law and the only reason Reuben and Bilha were allowed to live is because the entirety of the law was not revealed yet to the Israelites at that time of the violation of the law. So now I was going to talk about the testament of Reuben, but before I quote from it, I wanted just to touch again on the testament of the 12 patriarchs, ex explain again what this text is. The testament of the 12 patriarchs is a constituent of the apocryphal scriptures. It is a record of the last words and exhortations of the 12 sons of Jacob. In each testament, the patriarch first narrates his own life, dwelling on his virtues or his sins. Next, he exhorts his descendants to emulate the one and to avoid the other. Lastly, he launches out into prophetic visions of their futures. In these apocalyptic passages, the writings of Enoch are often appealed to and cited. Several of the manuscripts also include subtitles indicating the virtues in, in, included or the vices, no, in cool, whatever that word is, or the vices condemned by each of these patriarchs in turn. Thus, Reuben discourses of evil motives and desires, especially as regards women, Simon of envy, Levi of priesthood and pride, Judah of courage, avarice and fornication, Issachar of simple-mindedness, minded Zebulon of compassion and pity, then of danger and falsehood, Naphtali of natural goodness, God of hatred, Asher of the two characters of vice and virtue, Joseph of temperance and chastity, Benjamin of purity of heart. The testament of the twelve patriarchs are usually included in Armenian codices of the Bible. The Vatican Codex contains them in a Septuagint and entitles them as uh, Genesis. 
a critical edition taking account of the recovered Semitic text of the Greek codices in Ethos, Patmos, Paris, and Rome, and of the ancient Armenian and Slavonic version, was compiled and translated by Professor Charles. And again, whenever you see this underlined blue text, this is a URL, just click on it and it will take you to PDFs that you can download for free online. With no original Hebrew scrolls and containing messianic prophecies that seem too Christian-like, the testaments of the 12 patriarchs were dubbed to be Christian fiction. However, all that changed with the official discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. According to the Qumran community, and also to rabbinical sources, all of the patriarchs from Adam to Aaron, 37 or more, were prophets and all wrote testaments for their posterity. What's amazing is that not only do the DSS testify to this legend and contain five of the 12 testament of the sons of Jacob, but they also contain fragments of eight of the other testaments as well. The DSS contain fragments of the testaments of Enosh, Lamech, Noah, Abraham, Jacob, Levi, Judah, Naphtali, Joseph, Benjamin, Kohat, Amram and Aaron, some in Hebrew and some in Aramaic. That these texts were originally Jewish was conclusively proven by the findings in Qumran and by the fact that the information contained in the five fragments, Levi, Judah, Naphtali, Joseph, Benjamin, is identical to the information given in the full Latin versions of the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs published in the late 1800s. Okay, so let's read from the Testament of Reuben. This is his. In, in the court of law, there are always several versions of what happened. So here is this his version. And here, again, nakedness is interchangeably used with sinning woman and also with the corner of the garment. So this is Hebrew and English. Of course, I'll read the English. And now... My children, love the truth and it will preserve you. Hear you the words of Reuben, your father. Pay no heed to the face of a woman, nor associate with another man's wife, nor meddle with affairs of womankind. For had I not seen Bilha batting in a covered place, I had not fallen into this great iniquity. For my mind, taking in the thought of the woman's nakedness, suffered me not to sleep until I had drowned the abominable thing. For while Jacob our father had gone to Isaac his father, when we were in Eder, near to Ephraim in Bethlehem, Bilhah became drunk and was asleep, uncovered in her chamber. Sound like the same words as with Noah. <laughs> Having therefore gone in and beheld her nakedness, I wrought the impiety without her perceiving it, and leaving her sleeping, I departed. So this is a little bit different than what Jubilees told us. And forthwith an angel of God revealed to my father concerning my impiety, and he came and mourned over me and touched her no more. Pay no heed, therefore, my children, to the beauty of women, nor set your mind on their affairs, but walk in singleness of heart in the fear of the Lord, and expend labor on good works, and on study, and on your flocks, until the Lord give you a wife, whom he will, that you suffer not as I did. For until my father's death, I had not boldness to look in his face or to speak to any of my brethren because of their reproach. Even until now, my conscience caused me anguish on account of my impiety. And yet my father comforted me much and prayed for me unto the Lord that the anger of the Lord might pass from me, even as the Lord showed. And therefore, until now, I have been on my guard and sinned not. Wow. I want to speak to that the verse there. Pay no heed, therefore, my children, 
to the beauty of women, nor set your mind on their affairs. But walk in singleness of heart in the fear of the Lord, and expend labor on good works. Yes. And on study and on your flocks. So study and work. So here he's, tell, he's telling people, focus on your study, focus on your walk, your work, and do that in your life. And then he says here, until the Lord gives you a wife whom he will, that he suffers not as I did. Some great advice given here. And then also prior, the prior slide talked about the nakedness. He said, then I saw her nakedness. And once we talked about the eyes, yeah. the power in the yes. eyes, and that lust yes. and desire came over him because he yeah. saw something that he desired and favored and it drove him mad. And we see even nowadays the vastness of the pornography, how easy it is to get even on a cell phone for even children to have a yeah. cell phone. And it's just all out there. And it's going back to this point here. It's to put this stuff in front of people's eyes to draw them into fornication and or sin and not as his advice studying on the word and, and yeah. focus on single-heartedness and fear of the lord and let the father bring yeah. your spouse and his testament is a testament for repentance Absolutely. he really repented he actually for seven years he punished himself for seven years yes um, yeah we read so, about that too yeah, it's and, a very, uh, and it's it's another thing that his father saw that also because of his repentance and his sincerity of it. And his father yeah. was kind and also helped him with that, comforted him, and prayed yeah. for him. Yeah, so. yeah. And, and, and that's also a notable thing here is Jacob's forgiveness. Absolutely. How he forgave him. Okay. As you may know, I do not share my study or Ronit does not share her study with me so it's my first time hearing it so it's great stuff all right here's what I put together for Deuteronomy 23 I start with the assembly and I put in here the Strong's number and the word kohal the assembly convocation congregation and then I show how many times that word is used in the scriptures and mostly used as the word assembly and then the assembly of Yahweh that would be a holy assembly because it's of Yahweh. His presence is there, nothing unclean or defected to be in the direct presence. We read that many times. When Moses went up to the mount, take off your sandals, it's, it's unclean. And so we know that in the presence, when it's a holy place, it's going to be no defect or unclean presence there. This is a physical example here of the spiritual presence requirements. So in, in Deuteronomy 23, 1, it talks about the eunuchs. I want to start with that. No man with crushed testicles or whose male organ is cut off and is excluded from the assembly of Yahweh. So we want to read why is that. Leviticus 21, 17 through 23. Any man in whom is a physical defect shall not come near a blind man or lame or disfigured or deformed or a man in whom is a broken foot or broken hand or a hunchback or a dwarf or a spot in his eye or a skin disorder or a skin eruption or a crushed testicle. I'm tying that in here is not to come near. I believe this was taken into the, uh, the temple. Leviticus 21, 23, in, the, in that in those verses, it also gives specifically speaking to Aaron's offspring. Speak to Aaron saying, A man from your offspring throughout their generations in whom a physical defect shall not come near to present your God's food or offerings made by fire to Yahweh. He may eat his God's food from the most holy things and from holy things, but he must not enter the curtain and he must not come near to the altar because a physical defect is in him, and he must not profane my sanctuary, because I am Yahweh who consecrates him. So he's holy. It's a holy place, and they are not to profane the sanctuaries. Any of the Levitical priests who had some type of physical defect could serve, but they could not go into more or less the Holy of Holies in that presence. We also read in Leviticus 22, 20 through 24, you shall not present any animal in which is a physical defect, because it shall not be acceptable to you. And if any one brings a sacrifice of fellowship offering for Yahweh to fulfill a vow or free will offering from the cattle or from the flock, it must be without defect to be acceptable. 
There must not be any physical defect in it. The blind or the injured or the maimed or the seeping or one with a skin disorder or one with a skin eruption, these you shall not present to Yahweh, nor shall you give from them an offering made of fire on the altar for Yahweh. As for an ox or sheep that is deformed or that is stunted, you may present it as a free will offering, but for a vow it will not be accepted. And you shall not present anything for Yahweh with bruised, shattered, torn, or cut off testicles, and you shall not sacrifice such in your land. We see this common theme regarding this statement here. It fits into the physical defect category that cannot be in the presence of the holy. So I'll read here in Isaiah 56, 1 through 5 regarding eunuchs. Thus says Yahweh, Observe justice and do righteousness, for my salvation is close to coming, and my justice is being revealed. Happy is the man who does this, and the son of humankind who keeps hold of it, who keeps the Sabbath so as not to profane it, and who keeps his hand from doing any evil. And do not let the foreigner who joins himself to Yahweh say, Surely Yahweh will separate me from his people. And do not let the eunuch say, Look, I am a dry tree. For thus says Yahweh to the eunuchs who keep my Shabbats and choose that in which I delight and who keep hold of my covenant. And I will give them a monument and a name in my house and within my walls better than sons and daughters. I will give him an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. So here we see in Isaiah talking about the eunuchs that keep his Sabbaths to choose to do what is delightful to the Lord and who keep and hold his covenant, that there is great promise. So in reading this initially, you think the eunuchs, the people who have a defect and so forth, have a, quote, problem. But it's a physical thing that can't be in the presence of the holy. But if they keep the commandments and live to them, they will be given a greater reward because they could not do so here in the physical. And that reminds me of all of us here in this world who are challenged with our daily walk. If we persevere, if we prove ourselves, greater is our reward out there than those who just sit on, sit as a couch potato in life and going along. So I think that is a great testament that shares insight regarding the, to the eunuchs and thinking of it as a negative thing for all of the defect people out there. Yeah, they may not be able to go into the physical presence of the holy, but because of that, if they remain true, they will have a greater reward. And that's what I read here in Isaiah. So it's, it's, a, it's a blessing and a wonderful thing in that sense. Further on the assembly, it talks about the illegitimate child that is excluded also. So in Isaiah 57, 3 through 5, But you, come near here, you children of the soothsayer, offspring of an adulterer, and she who commits fornication. At whom do you make fun? At whom do you open your mouth and stick out your tongue? Are you not children of transgression, offspring of deception, who burn with lust among the oaks under a leafy tree, who slaughter children in the valleys under the clefts of the rocks? Illegitimate children is what I'm pointing out here. And then in John 8, 41 through 44, those Jews speaking to Yeshua, you are doing the deeds of your father. They said to him, we were not born from sexual immorality. We have one father, Yahweh. And Yeshua said to them, if Yahweh were your father, you would love me. For I have come forth from Yahweh and have come. I have not come from myself, but that one who sent me. Why do you not understand my way of speaking? Because you are not able to listen to my message. You are of the father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of, of your father? That one was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand firm in the truth because truth is not in him. Whenever he speaks the lie, he speaks from his own nature because he is a liar and the father of lies. And with Hebrews 12, 6 through 8, for Yahweh disciplines the one whom he loves and punishes every son whom he accepts. Endure it for discipline. Yahweh is dealing with you as sons. For what son is there whom a father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, 
in which all legitimate sons have become participants, then you are illegitimate and not sons. So even though you were a legitimate son originally, your conduct renders you illegitimate and not sons. Yes. Like illegitimate sons. Correct. Yeah. If you are not okay. committed, you are not following in discipline. If you walk mm -hmm. away from it, you are now illegitimate child. And I wanted to tie that in because the illegitimate child is uh, is removed from the from the holy assembly. And so we see what is a what does this mean allegorically? What does this mean? What's it telling us? And it's basically saying that those who are not in the walk in the faith, they are Ill illegitimate. And this is the example of Deuteronomy talking about the illegitimate child. Now, that illegitimate child, even if they're born in or under these circumstances as a child of an adulterer or whoever, that child, if they become a convert and believe and follow and obey, they will have a great reward. I just wanted to say all of this to, for people to understand that these people aren't excluded from any type of salvation or rewards. It's the understanding that they can't be in the holy presence of the temple and of a holy assembly. But if they remain faithful, they will have a greater blessing. And then I want to talk about the Ammonite and the Moabite that's mentioned in verses 3 through 6, even to the 10th generation. Because they did not come to me with, they did not, because they did not come to meet you with food and with water when you came out of Egypt, and also because they hired Balaam, son of Beor, from Pethor in the Aram Naharaim to act against you to curse you. Now we read in Genesis, who are the Moabites and Ammonites? The two daughters of Lot became pregnant by their father. The firstborn gave birth to a son, and she called his name Moab. He is the father of the Moab until this day. And the younger, she gave birth to the son, and she called his name Ben-Ami. He is the father of the Ammonites until this day. So now we know where they came from. So they from are Lot. illegitimate. So they would be Illegit illegitimate, illegitimate children, mm -hmm. yes. And, we, and it talks about the 10th generation, so I didn't do the time frame on that, but yes. And Nehemiah, Nehemiah 13. On that day, the book of Moses was read in the hearing of the people, and it was found written in it that no Am Ammonite or Moabite should ever come into the assembly of God because they did not come to meet Israelites with bread and water, but hired Balaam against them in order to curse them. But our God changed the curse into a blessing. So it happened when they heard the law that they separated all the foreign people from Israel. All the nations, Genesis 22, 18, all the nations of the earth will be blessed through your offspring. It's talking to Abraham. Because you have listened to my voice. Who are Abraham's offering, offspring? Those who have faith, obedience, compassion, and justice. You know, the converts. You are the stranger, the convert, who sojourns among you. Psalm 146, 9, Yahweh protects the strangers. The Gur, as we talked about the Gur, the Gar. He okay. helps... The orphan and the widow, by the way of the wicked, he, thwart, he thwarts. In Ezekiel 18 to 20, 22, the person, the one sinning, will die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, and the father shall not bear the guilt of the son. Through his righteousness that he has done, he shall live. So we keep Ezekiel in mind, and then we read Ruth, and then I'll recap. Ruth 1, 12 through 16, Naomi said to her Moabite daughter-in-law, Turn back, my daughter, go. For I am too old to have a husband. If I should think that there is hope for me, even if I should have a husband this night, and even if I should bear sons, would you therefore wait until they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is far more bitter to me than to you. For the hand of Yahweh has gone out against me. And they lifted up their voices and cried again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her and said to her, Look, your sister-in-law has returned to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law too. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go, and where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. We see here Ruth was a Moabite, and she ends up being the mother of Obed, which then fathers Jesse, which then fathers David, which then father goes down to Yeshua. Here we have a, a Moabite in the lineage, but what did she do? 
She followed Ruth and her God and obeyed. And then we read also in with Boaz and all of that. She was a convert and dedicated and very honorable. There is also the position that this was towards the males of the nation, but we also see that Yah forbids his children not to intermarry with the other nations, so I really don't see that position as being very valid when people say the offspring of the Ammonites and Moabites to 10th generation was just, quote, male to the males, them. No, it's all of them yeah. except if they, I mentioned it in the first week, that in week 46, that there wasn't a formal conversion process in those days. People just joined, geographically joined the Israelites and adapted their belief system and started following the commandments and then they officially became converts. So my point to this was here, if you were an Ammonite or a Moabite, you weren't cursed forever. You had the option, just like the eunuch, just like the illegitimate child, to come under the faith and obedience and then you weren't under this curse anymore. So you know that every week I have one or two rabbit trails. So this is this is my rabbit trail for this week. Deuteronomy twenty three fourteen, for Yahweh your God is walking about in the midst of your camp to deliver you and to hand your enemies over to you, before you. And so let your camp be holy, so that he shall not see in it anything indecent nakedness and he shall turn away from going with you additional references to yahweh walking in the midst of his people genesis then they heard the sound of yahweh god walking in the garden at the windy time of day and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of yahweh god among the trees of the garden and yahweh god called to the man and said to him where are you and he replied, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I am naked, so I hid myself. Samuel, Second Samuel, go and tell my servant David, thus says Yahweh, are you the one to build for me a house for my dwelling? For I, I have not dwelt in a house from the day I brought up the Israelites from Egypt until this day. Rather, I was going, walking, in Hebrew, about in a tent and in a tabernacle. In all of my going, walking, about, among, in the midst of all the Israelites, did I speak a word with one of the tribes of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why did you not build me a cedar house? So just reminding you, whenever I put an alternate word in brackets, that means this is what it actually says in Hebrew. Okay, the, I, I've yet to find an English translation that actually <laughs> translates Hebrew 100%. Okay, Exodus. Go to a land flowing with milk and honey, but I, Yahweh, will not go up among, or actually I will not go, walk in the midst of you because you are a stiff naked people lest I destroy you on the way and the people heard this troubling word and they mourned and they each did not put their ornaments on themselves that's following the golden calf sin and Yahweh said to Moses said to the Israelites you are a stiff naked people if one moment I were to go up and in the midst of you, I would destroy you. And now take down your ornaments from you, from on you, and I will decide what I will do to you. And the Israelites stripped themselves of their ornaments from Mount Oreb onward. Whether his people could actually see Yah or not, that does not alter the fact of what these verses unambiguously say. Yah walks or dwell in the midst of the camp of his people. Yah is holy, therefore the camp must be kept holy at all times to accommodate his presence. Hebrew is a unique language when it comes to word studies. Every word carries the meaning of the root word that it derived from originally. In this way, the Hebrew word for holy, Kodesh, comes from the root word Kadash, Kuf Dalechin. The idea of holy is important for an understanding of Yahweh, of worship, and of the people of Yahweh in the Bible. 
Holy has four distinct meanings. To be set apart, this applies to places where Yahweh is present, like the temple and the tabernacle, and to things and persons related to those holy places or to Yahweh himself. Thus, what is holy is separated from common use or held sacred, especially by virtue of its being clean and pure. To be perfect, transcendent, or spiritually pure, that's number two, evoking adoration and reverence. <coughs> number three, something or someone who evokes veneration or awe being frightening beyond belief. And four, filled with superhuman and potential fatal power. This speaks of Yahweh, but also of places or things or person which have been set apart by Yahweh's presence. To be sanctified is to be made holy. <coughs> Yah is holy. Fire is the symbol of holy power. Jealousy, wrath, remoteness, cleanliness, glory, and majesty are related to it. He is unsearchable, incomprehensible, incomparable, great, wonderful, and exalted. His name is holy. There are numerous references to this in Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Psalms. Holiness is in tension with relational personhood. Holiness tends towards separation and uniqueness. Personhood determines relations and close communion. Holiness inspires awe and fear. Personhood inspires love and the wish to be near. Both are in the Bible as necessary ways to think of and experience Yahweh. Both are necessary if one is to avoid shallow, one-sided thinking about Yahweh. Neither holiness nor personhood alone can do justice to the biblical portrayal of Yahweh. Both, in their mutual tension, help capture a more adequate understanding and experience of Yahweh. This is clearly demonstrated in Exodus 33 and also in Leviticus 16, 17, and 19. Peter tells us that people who obey Yah's righteous laws are considered holy and acceptable to Yah. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former desires you used to conform to in your ignorance. But as the one who called you is holy, you yourselves be holy in all your conduct. For it is written, you will be holy because I am holy. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's work, conduct yourself with fear during the time of your temporary residence. So it goes back to being holy and walking in obedience. And by doing so, we can be in commune and in, in relationship and in, and in his presence. Yes. When Yah told Israel to be holy in Leviticus 11, 19, he was instructing them to be distinct from the other nations by giving them specific regulations to govern their lives. Israel is Yah's chosen nation and Yah has set them apart from all other people groups. They are his special people and consequently they were given standards that Yah wanted them to live by so the world would know they belong to him. When Israel left Egypt, Exodus 12.37 states that there were 600,000 men on foot. Men on foot is generally considered men of fighting age. This does not include women, children, or the elderly. It is estimated that over 2 million people left Egypt. For 40 years, the Israelites wandered in the wilderness. 2 million people living in tents for 40 years in the desert can be complicated from cleanliness and hygiene perspective. This could be why Yah gave Israel additional rules to follow that were less about righteousness and more about maintaining a, a healthy body, a healthy community, and a healthy camp, campground. These rules may be found in the following passages. So I listed all of the passages from Leviticus and numbers and basically they the rules are about touching dead bodies diseased unclean person had to be quarantined outside the camp until infection ceased 
clothing contaminated by mold or mildew had to be washed. When the disease was gone, the person had to wash his clothes, shave off all his hair and butt with water. Diarrhea and other discharges meant disease, uncleanliness, and the ill person as well as all those around him had to wash their clothes and bath in fresh running water. Bathing and cloth washing, semen and menstrual blood were unclean and required water cleansing. The seemingly tedious list in Leviticus of clean and unclean, unclean that required water cleansing were in reality medical method. I hate using the word medical. I couldn't come up with anything else of preventing the spread of infectious diseases as well as practical practices that reinforce the need to be clean outside. To be clean outside was a metaphor and a precursor for inward spiritual purity. Back to Deuteronomy 23. The holiness of the camp of Israel and the people of Israel is directly linked to the literal presence of Yah, who is holy and therefore where he walks or dwells is holy and must be kept holy by his people. In this week's portion, Yah adds rules in regard to how to keep defilement away from the camp so it remains holy. While a man is asleep, semen may come from his sex part that makes him unclean, so he must go outside the camp, he must stay there all day, in the evening, he must wash himself. At sunset, he can return into the camp. Next, do not defecate within the camp boundaries. Defecating is considered indecent, unsanitary, and unhealthy. Always carry a small spade with your other tools when defecate outside the camp. Dig a hole with your spade and then bury your dung in it and cover it with earth. That reminded me of cats, by the way. Yeah, must not see anything that would bring shame on you. Do not make him turn away from you. But beyond the physical boundaries of the camp, time and again, Yah's people were made aware of the correlation between their external cleanliness and internal purity. As outside, so inside. In Exodus, and Moses went down from the mountain to the people, and he consecrated the people, and they washed their clothes. Isaiah, wash, make yourselves clean, remove the evil of your doings from before my eyes, cease to do evil. Ezekiel, and I will sprinkle on you pure water, and you will be clean from all of your uncleanness, and I will cleanse you from all of your idols. Psalms, purify me with Aesop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Second Corinthians, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of body and spirit, accomplishing holiness in the fear of God. Hebrews, let us approach with a true heart in the full assurance of faith, our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. As outside, so inside. To sum it all up, the benefit of keeping the camp slash habitat holy is multifold. One, building up obedience and righteousness. Two, preserving personal and public health and promoting physical fitness. Three, preserving his continuous presence in our midst. And four, enabling a, relation, a relational personhood or personal relationship with him. And for those who may be new, we do drop a PDF in the recordings of the week channel so you can download it or open it up and follow along or follow along on the live streaming and take notes or write down any questions. Deuteronomy chapter 24. When a man takes a wife and he marries her and then she does not please him because he found something objectionable and writes her a letter of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her away from his house and she goes from his house and she goes out and becomes a wife for another man. Then the second man dislikes her and he writes her a letter of divorce and places it into her hand and sends her from his house. Or if the second man dies who took her to himself as a wife, 
Her first husband who sent her away is not allowed to take her again to become a wife to him after she has been defiled. For that is a detestable thing before Yahweh. And so you shall not mislead into sin the land that Yahweh your God is giving to you as an inheritance. When a man takes a new wife, he shall not go out with the army, and he shall not be obligated with anything. He shall be free from obligation to stay at home for one year, and he shall bring joy to his wife that he took. A person shall not take a pair of millstones or an upper millstone, for he is taking necessities of life as a pledge. If a man is caught kidnapping somebody from among his countrymen, the Israelites, and he treats him as a slave or he sells him, then that kidnapper shall die, and so you shall purge the evil from among you. Be watchful with respect to an outbreak of any infectious skin disease by being very careful and by acting according to all that the priests and the Levites have instructed you, just as I have commanded them, so you shall diligently observe. So remember what Yahweh your God did to Miriam on the journey when you went out from Egypt. When you make a loan to your neighbor, a loan of any kind, you shall not go into his house to take his pledge. You shall wait outside, and the man to whom you are lending, he shall bring the pledge outside to you. And if he is a needy man, you shall not sleep in his pledge. You shall certainly return the pledge to him as the sun sets, so that he may sleep in his cloak and may bless you. And it shall be considered righteousness on your behalf before Yahweh your God. You shall not exploit a hired worker, who is needy and poor, from among your fellow men, or from among your aliens who are in your land and in your towns. On his day you shall give his wage, and the sun shall not go down, because he is poor and his life depends on it. Do this so that he does not cry out against you to Yahweh, and you incur guilt. Fathers shall not be put to death because of their children, and children shall not be put to death because of their fathers. Each one shall be put to death for his own sin. You shall not subvert the rights of an alien or an orphan, and you shall not take as pledge the garment of a widow. And you shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt, and that Yahweh your God redeemed you from there. Therefore I am commanding you to do this commandment. When you reap your harvest in your field, and you forget a sheaf in the field, you shall not return to get it. For it shall be for the alien, for the orphan, and for the widow, so that Yahweh your God may bless you at all the work of your hands. When you beat off the fruit of your olive trees, you shall not search through the branches afterward. For it shall be for the alien, for the orphan, and for the widow. When you harvest grapes, you shall not glean your vineyards again. It shall be for the alien, for the orphan, and for the widow. And you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. Therefore, I am commanding you to do this thing. In Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 1, I'll start with when a man takes his wife and he marries her, and then she does not please him. We see this word, Chen, has favor or grace because he found something objectionable. Now, that word was erva, nakedness, dishonor, grace. It's idiomatic for sexual relations, the shame of one being naked. So that word definitely implies more than just something objectionable and writes her a letter of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her away from his house. So this term, objectionable, I want to elaborate more with some other verses to show that he found something that did not please him that was objectionable. And that objectionable thing, to me, in the way I read this in other verses, would point to perhaps that he found that she had, was not a virgin. She was not what he had expected and was not pleased in his findings because once he marries her, then that's when he finds out. So to look at that, Leviticus 18, 1 to 30, this nakedness is directly tied to the unlawfulness of sexual relations. And Ronit covered this nakedness in depth, so I think we all understand that. The husband found some evidence of sexual relations, is the way I interpreted that in reading all the other verses regarding this specific word. And in Jeremiah 3, 6 through 8a, Then Yahweh said to me in the days of Josiah the king, Have you seen what apostate Israel has done? She has gone on every high, every high hill, and under every leafy tree, and she has prostituted herself here or there. And I thought, after her doing all these things to me, she will return. But she did not return. And her treacherous sister Judah saw it. And I saw that for this very reason, that on account of apostate Israel committing adultery, I divorced her and gave her a letter of divorce to her. Here I'm tying that in with what Yah speaks to with the land and the peoples of Judah. 
And then in verses 2 to 3 in Deuteronomy 24, and she goes from his house, continuing, and she goes out and becomes a wife of another man. And then the second man dislikes. And that word dislikes in Hebrew is sane. It's to hate intensely, ho intense hostility and hatred, usually deriving from fear, anger, or a sense of injury, extreme dislike. So he dislikes her, just hates her. And he writes her a letter of divorce and places it into her hand and sends her from his house. Or if the second man dies, who took her to himself as a wife, her first husband who sent her away is not allowed to take her again. Let's look at Romans 7, 1 through 3. Or do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law is master of a person for as long as time as he lives. For the married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law of the husband. Therefore, as a result, if she belongs to another man while her husband is living, she will be called an adulteress. But if he dies, then she's free from the law. She won't be an adulteress. So here the woman, the woman's second husband dies. And so now she's free to marry again, but... But she cannot marry the first husband. But she cannot marry, first of all, yeah. She cannot marry him again. And because she has been defiled, for that is a detestable thing before Yahweh, and so you should not mislead into sin in, in the land of Yahweh your God is giving you an inheritance. The first man could have taken her back if she did not marry, have sexual relations. The first man could have chosen not to divorce her in the first place due to the impur impurity. So there's different options here, but this is how it played out. In verse 5, when a man takes a new wife, he shall not go out with the army, and he shall not be ob obligated with anything. He shall be free from obligation to stay at home for one year, and he shall bring joy to his wife that he took. That's nice. That is very nice. I like it. Yes. <laughs> and it's a great thing. That way they have a year to know each other and be with each other to start their life off instead of him immediately going to write the work and <laughs> and being gone for weeks, months, or who knows how long from the initial marriage. The man who got engaged to a woman and has not married her, let him go and return to his house. So he does not die in battle and another man marries her. In Ephesians 5.28, thus also husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. The one who loves his own wife loves himself. So I wanted to tie that in, that this is the reason why when getting married, if you love your wife, you're going to be dedicating yourself to her, especially that first year in getting to know each other and building the relationship for your life, the rest of your life. And in verse 7, if a man is caught kidnapping... And these are miscellaneous laws I'm going to touch on. If a man's caught kidnapping somebody from among his countrymen, so if he's kidnapping someone among the people of Israel, and he treats him as a slave or sells him, then the kidnapper shall die, and so shall purge the evil from among you. So once again, it goes back to this purging of stoning, killing, those doing grievous sins that are going to cause problems in, in the camp. And this specific one, if the man kidnaps someone, but he treated him good and then let him go, he would not be, it's specifically saying now, if he did do this and, I mean, he would suffer some type of punishment, but he would not be stoned to death or killed. And verses eight to nine, be watchful for an outbreak of any infectious skin diseases for, the, for that law. And then 10 through 13, when you make a loan to your neighbor with a pledge, do not, basically do not go into his house and take his pledge. Wait for it outside. Be respectful. He, the other person is to honor them and do it. You should not have to go in and be that way. And if he's a needy man, if he didn't have much or doesn't have much to even take care of himself, then you should, in this example, is give his cloak back at night. So if you take the pledge during the day to more or less for him to fulfill his loan, then you give it back to him at night so he can at least sleep warm. And this way he doesn't curse you to Yahweh. We've read that many times where people can curse you to Yahweh and you will be cursed because you're not doing the right thing. You're doing the law, but you're not doing it the right way. And then verses 14 through 15, do not exploit the brethren or foreign workers. So obviously if you have anyone working for you, hired, you don't exploit them. You pay them their day's wage before the sun goes down. 
And then do not subvert the rights of an alien or an orphan. And do not take a pledge from the garment of a widow. It's always talking about the widows, the orphans, and here the alien are strangers and, and those... They are um, always grouped together. Girl, almana, v'yatom. Always those three. Yeah, the new converts, the orphans, mm-hmm. and the widows. You, you got to take care of them so that they they are lacking and you, we've, we have to be a cover. And then verses 19 to 22, the stranger once again, the orphan and the widow, you shall let them have from your abundance of your crops. And I think we'll read that in either... The next, I think the next chapter perhaps, about if you have any leftovers of your crops to let them f- feel free to eat from them. Yeah, so many of the laws are focused on the unfortunate in society. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, any questions regarding chapter 24 before we proceed? Yeah, I find it interesting. I think there's always a lot of controversy with the marriage and divorcing things. And I know that what the Torah says about divorcing and remarrying and stuff like that. And I know that in the, a lot of like circles where there's like really a, such a big divide in can you remarry, can you not remarry in the Torah? And I just thought it was really interesting you don't really hear the details, like how you guys laid it out here. You don't really hear the definitions that you were saying about that there was more to her just putting her away and that he found iniquity in her or something because it doesn't really give a lot of information in there and i thought that was really interesting yes how you got out and that there was a lot more to it than when you're reading in the hebrew than that we actually get in english yes Yeah, yeah i find that a lot in scripture when i'm digging into something and it's not clear then it always tells me there's something more to this phrase so when a sentence or a paragraph is talking about a certain topic and it's not clear, then there's either a word or words that may not be fully understood or there's a phrase in it, an idiom or something that is referring to something else that will answer what this truly means. And, and that goes back to Yeshua and his parables. I always use that because he uses certain phrases and terminology and examples for you to understand another explanation. And if we don't understand some of these phrases and meanings, like the, just the uncovering the nakedness, like what the heck does that mean? We could use phrases in 2020 that people, you know, 100 years ago, what does that mean? So I think it's a similar sense and you have to dig deeper into this to, to put it together and to understand w- what's being said here and why. And it makes it makes sense. Yeah, and that's why it was so important for me to dive into the nakedness thing and the different terms used to describe basically a sec- an iniquity and a sexual relationship that is, is not right. And I'm glad you did because that was way deeper than what I did here because I've done this study before and the uncovering and nakedness piece, so I'm glad you did that. And then tying this particular one in, it, it definitely, it's it's. Once again, it's not clear, but it's definitely stating that they were found something unfavorable in this woman, and it's referring to her nakedness. We discovered this, so yes. it implies that she was found to be impure. At least that's how I read it from all of the text. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah, I think that's just really great clarification, because I think that's a really big key piece that we miss in this, because... I know there's, like I said, there's a lot of controversy in that, and I'm really thankful that you did a deeper study on that. Thank you. Yeah, the only thing that I was not fully clear on in this was the second man disliking the woman and divorcing her. Didn't really, really didn't give the same annotations of any anything impure, but it could be because it, if the first man found something, then obviously the second man would have found the same thing or something similar or he just in this case really hated her whatever reason it was it does not give it's not too clear on the second guy but but obviously he dies and then she's free and then we know yeshua clarifies the divorce piece circumstances deuteronomy chapter 25 when a legal dispute takes place between men and they come near to the court and the judges judge with respect to them Then they shall declare the righteous to be in the right, and they shall condemn the wicked. Then it will happen if the guilty one deserves beating. Then the judge shall make him lie, and he shall beat him before him, according to the prescribed number of lashes proportionate to the offense. 
he may beat him with forty lashes, and he shall not do more than these, so that he will not beat more in addition to these many blows. And your countrymen would be degraded before your eyes. You shall not muzzle an ox when he is threshing. When brothers dwell together and one of them dies and has no son, the wife of the deceased shall not become the wife of a man of another family. Her brother-in-law shall have sex with her, and he shall take her to himself as a wife, and he shall perform his duty as a brother-in-law with respect to her. And then the firstborn that she bears shall represent his dead brother, so that his name is not blotted out from Israel. But if the man does not want to take his sister-in-law, then his sister-in-law shall go up to the gate to the elders, and she shall say, My brother-in-law refused to perpetuate his brother's name in Israel, for he is not willing to marry me. Then the elders of his town shall summon him and speak to him, and if he persists and says, I do not desire to marry her, that his sister-in-law shall go near him before the eyes of the elders, and she shall pull off his sandal from his foot, and she shall spit in his face, and she shall declare, and she shall say, This is how it is done to the man who does not build the house of his brother, and his family shall be called in Israel, the house where the sandal was pulled off. If a man and his brother fight each other, and the wife of the one man comes near to rescue her husband from the hand of his attacker, and she stretches out her hand, and she seizes his genitals, then you shall cut off her hand, your eyes shall not take pity, there shall not be for your use in your bag two kinds of stone weights, a large one and a small one, there shall not be in your house for your use two kinds of measures. Rather, a full and honest weight shall be for your use. There shall be for you a full and honest measure, so that your days on the land that Yahweh your God has given to you may be long. For detestable to Yahweh your God is everyone who is doing such things, everyone who is acting dishonestly. Remember what Amalek did to you on the journey when you went out from Egypt, that he met you on the journey and attacked you, all those lagging behind you, and when you were weary and worn out, and he did not fear God, and when Yahweh your God gives rest to you from all your enemies from around about you in the land that Yahweh your God is giving to you as an inheritance to take possession of it, you shall blot out the remembrance of the Malik from under the heavens. You shall not forget. I'll start with the first three verses. Punishment had a prescribed amount of lashes for the crime when it was not a death penalty crime. So have you seen the purging talking about more or less the death penalty, the stoning of death. And then here we see punishment also has a prescribed amount of lashes. Whatever they were is what was determined then. I don't think there is any scriptures that gives a list of that, but it's definitely implied here. The prescribed number of lashes proportionate to the offense was mentioned. So we know that is there. And do and beat him with 40 lashes. You may beat him with 40 lashes, and he may and he shall not do more than these so that he will not beat more in addition to these many blows and your countrymen would be degraded before his eyes so there's this law put in place that don't beat him more than 40 lashes it's bad enough you don't want to degrade him any worse it's been it's i guess you would say it's he, he's been beaten so bad that's enough there's yeah a you limit. don't want to kill yeah, him yeah you don't want to kill him there's a limit to... yeah and we see in matthew 27 26 then he released barabbas for them but after he had Yeshua flogged, he handed him over so that he could be crucified. And we know Yeshua was lashed. And regarding Deuteronomy 25 verse 11, If a man and his brother fight each other, and his wife of the one man comes to the rescue of her husband, and she attacks the other ones, seizing his genitals, her hand shall be cut off, and your eye shall take no pity. The reason why this is so harsh for the woman to do this it's more or less it's stating don't do that do something else but don't do that and the reason is the man's seed is obviously held there in the genitals you don't want to affect or destroy or hurt the man's genitals we talked about the eunuch and what that that whole scene and what it does is going to make him unclean etc for the rest of his life and also it affects his descendants so you may destroy, eliminate, kill all of his descendants if he cannot have children. So you're not just harming the man, you may be harming his entire lineage. It was a serious offense due to that. So do something else, but don't... So I guess Krav Maga is not uh, kosher. Krav Maga would, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's one of the things they do teach you is that, yeah. that strike is uh-huh. one of the yeah. first strikes. Yeah, you're, you're so right. Okay, <laughs> verses 13 and 15. There shall not be for your use in your bag two kinds of stone weights. So it's, talk, it's talking about full and honest weight. 
But you're not to be dishonest. That's more or less what this is saying. No dishonesty shall be among us. And it's detestable to Yahweh, your Elohim. Everyone who is doing such things, everyone who is acting dishonestly is just detestable to Yahweh. Keep that in mind. We are to be and do things honestly. And then lastly here for me in verses 5 through 10, I want to talk about the brother-in-law, the kinsman redeemer. And as we read that if the wife of the dead person, she shall not go out to a strange man, but her brother-in-law, which is the her dead husband's brother, shall go unto her and take her to himself for a wife and shall perform the duty of the kinsman redeemer. And it shall be so that she may have a firstborn that she may raise for the dead husband and his dead husband's name so that they may have an inheritance. So this is a protection for the lineage of the family. If the man was to die and they did not have any children, so this was an option that could be done so that this woman could have a lineage because that is one of the things that they were instructed to do is to have children. And it was definitely an honor to have ch children and especially male children to carry on the lineage. And if that person, that brother-in-law does not want to perform and has no desire to do, then there's a process that takes place in front of a priest. And the woman should take off the shoe off of his foot and spit in his face so it shall be done to the man who will not build up the house of his brother, and his name shall be called in Israel the house of him whose shoes were taken off. We read in Ruth 4, 3 through 12, and I'll paraphrase this. That's right here. Ruth was told to go to Boaz here as a kinsman redeemer from Naomi. Okay, so she goes to Boaz, and Boaz finds favor in her, and he wants to redeem her, but there is a closer relative than him to her dead husband. So he basically he tells her that he can't do anything. We'll go in the morning. He will go and approach the kinsman redeemer that's closer in front of the elders and ask. And the way he does it is so genuine because he doesn't even say anything. He just says that Naomi has this plot of land. Do you want to be the, the redeemer of this from Naomi? And he, of course, says yes. And then he says, oh, and by the way, she has a daughter whose husband died. And basically, you will have to provide and be her, provide her seed. And he did not want to do that because his inheritance he wanted to keep within his family from having a son elsewhere. And he rejects it. And then Boaz accepts it. And that transaction takes place at the gate. And without Naomi or Ruth interference, Boaz took care of it all, came back, and let them know. And he said he has acquired a wife to raise up in the name of the dead over his inheritance. Such a great story of the kinsman redeemer and what he does and why he does it is a wonderful story. In Genesis 38, Judah and Tamar, we see that Judah marries a Canaanite woman, Shua, and bears three sons, Ur, Onan, and Shelah. Judah gets Ur a wife, which is Tamar, but Ur purposefully does not get her pregnant and is killed by Yah. The same with his brother, Onan. And you got to read that story of yeah, how and why all that happened. There's a lot yeah. to that. There's a lot to explain. Mm -hmm. But my point is, Judah tells Tamar to wait for his youngest son to be old enough. And then time goes on and he never does anything with his youngest son. So then Tamar goes and poses as a prostitute and is impregnated by Judah. And Judah wants her punished for her whoredom, then realizes it was him and does not punish her and seeks forgiveness, not touching her again. And she then gives birth to two, two twins, Perez and Zareth. So we see that Judah realizes that he did not do the right thing for the kinsman redeemer process. And so he was sinning. It was just a big mess. And they all sought forgiveness and walked correctly afterwards and learn from this lesson. But I just wanted to point that out as part of this kinsman redeemer scenario. The three verses that caught my attention and got me on my last Rabbi trail for tonight are 17 through 19. The Amalekites were a formidable tribe of nomads living in the area south of Canaan, between Mount Seir and the Egyptian border. 
The Amalekites are not listed in the table of nations in Genesis 10, as they did not originate until after Esau's time. In Numbers 24.20, Balaam refers to the Amalekites as first among the nations, but he most likely meant only that the Amalekites were the first ones to attack the Israelites upon their exodus from Egypt, or that the Amalekites were first in power at that time. We first learn about Amalek in Genesis. Genesis 36, 1 through 12, tells us the story of Esau, whose name was also Edom. Esau took his wives from the daughters of Canaan, and then he has a concubine, and let me see, I'm trying to skip all of the verses. So dwelled in the hill country of Seir. Now these are the descendants of Esau, the father of Edom, in the hill country of Seir. Verse 9. These are the names of the sons of Esau, Eliphaz, the son of Ada, the wife of Esau, Reuel, the son of Basmat, the wife of Esau. The sons of Eliphaz were Teman, Omar, Ziphor, Gatam, and Kenaz. Now Timna was the concubine of Eliphaz, the son of Esau, and she bore Amalek to Eliphaz. These are the sons of Ada, the wife of Esau. So basically Amalek was the grandson of Esau. Esau's genealogy shows us he was successful and prosperous, spawning generations of Edomites and confirming what Rebekah foresaw, that Esau and his twin brother Jacob would spawn two nations. The Edomites became vicious foes of Israel, regularly attacking them through many years of violent wars. Edomites did not worship Yahweh and instead chose Kas or Kos as their principal deity. They will later be known as Edomians by the Romans and produce one of the Bible's most notable four, Herod, Herod the Great. Amalek was the grandson of Esau. His offspring became the nation of Amalek, and they lived to the south of the land of Israel in what is now known as the Negev Desert. The name Amalek refers to the nations found there. His descendants, the Amalekites, or the territories of Amalek which they inhabited. How could the grandson of Esau become the ancestor of the quintessential enemy of the Israelites. Like the grandfather of his nation Esau, the Amalekites had an inborn hatred towards Israel. They took any and every opportunity to attack the Israelites for absolutely no reason. There was no land dispute or provocation that caused this hatred. It was an intrinsic pathological need to destroy Yahweh's people. Such hatred cannot be compared combated through diplomacy. There was no option to re-educate the Amalekites or, over or review their school curriculum. Their hatred was not taught. It was ingrained. As long as an Amalekite walked the earth, no Israelite was safe. It was a clear case of kill or be killed. An Israelite had to take the command to kill Amalek quite literally, his life depended on it. We first hear about the nation of Amalek in Exodus 17. The Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, Choose some of our men and go out to fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. So Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the hill. As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. When Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held his hands up, one on one side, one on the other, so that his hands remained steady till sunset. While the Israelites were still at Rephidim, recuperating from the recent escape from Egypt, the nation of Amalek launched a vicious surprise attack on them. 
Though the Israelites had no intentions to invade the Amalekite territory, nor they were even headed in that direction. Joshua and a unit of special forces were fighting against Amalek, while Moses was on top of a hill, interceding with the staff of God. As long as Moses kept his hands held up, Joshua prevailed, but whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites prevailed. Moses' hands grew weary and tired, so Aaron and Hur had Moses sit on a stone while they held his hands up and steady until Joshua had overcome the enemy with the sword by sunset. I have always pondered the, significant, the significance of Moses' roles, role at that battle. In no other place in the Bible do we have a similar scenario. Usually the Israelites were commanded to fight without their leader having to engage in an interesting ritual of lifting their hands up. And then it dawned on me, while the Amalekites lifted their hands up against the throne of Yah, Moses lifted his hands up to the throne of Yah. To the throne of Yah. Exodus 17 concludes this account with the following. And Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. And Yahweh said to Moses, Write this as a memorial in the scroll and recite it in the hearing of Joshua, because I will utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under the heavens. And Moses built an altar and he called its name Yahweh is my banner. And he said, because the hand was against the throne of Yah, a war will be for Yahweh with Amalek from generation to generation. The same story is recounted in this week's portion. Remember what Amalek did to you on the journey when you went out from Egypt, that he met you on the journey and attacked you, all those lagging behind you, and when you were weary and worn out, and he did not fear God, and when Yahweh your God gives rest to you from all your enemies from around about you in the land that Yahweh your God is giving to you as an inheritance to take possession of it, you shall blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under the heavens. You shall not forget. So what happened to the Amalekites? In 1 Samuel we read, Saul captured Agag, the king of Amalek, alive, but all the people he utterly destroyed with the edge of the sword. This passage implies that Saul destroyed Agag's army down to the last man. However, there is no claim being made by this passage that every living Amalekite was killed, just the ones in Agag's army. In 1 Samuel 27, So David struck the land and did not leave a man or a woman alive. He took the sheep, the cattle, the donkeys, the camel, and the clothing. This passage implies that David destroyed all of the Amalekites in that certain area of land that he attacked. If there were Amalekites in other areas, then this verse makes no claim in regards to them. 1 Samuel 30, then David attacked them from twilight until the evening of the next day. Not a man of them escaped except 400 young men who rode off on camels and fled. In this passage, David destroyed a raiding party of Amalekites, but 400 men escaped. 1 Chronicle, and they destroyed the remainder of the Amalekites who had escaped, and they have lived there to this day. In this passage, the Shimonites killed all the Amalekites that lived in a particular area. And in Esther, the last mention of the Amalekites is found in the book of Esther, where Haman the Agagite, a descendant of the Amalekite king Agag, connives to have all the Jews in Persia annihilated by order of King Xerxes. Yah saved the Jews in per Persia, however, and Hamani's son and the rest of Israel's enemy were destroyed instead. However, based on all of these verses, clearly the seed of Amalek has not been completely wiped out. 
<clears throat> the Israelites had negative encounters with other nations on their way to the Promised Land. They fought wars with the Midianites and the Amorites. Balak, Balak king of Moab, tried to have them cursed, and the Edomites wouldn't let them pass peacefully through their land. And yet, only the Amalekites became Yahweh's eternal enemies. Even the Egyptians who enslaved the Israelites and threw their baby boys into the Nile are protected. So what's so special about the Amalekites? Three of the, three, three of the 613 commandments in the Torah involve Amalek. Remember, number one, remember what the Amalekites did to the Israelites. Number two, never forget the evil deeds Amalek did. And number three, obliterate the nation of Amalek. The Torah makes it clear that Amalek is not just a political enemy. He is a spiritual enemy. He is the enemy of Yahweh. If you were to stare evil in the eye, what would you see? What would be its character? character traits. First and foremost, he does not fear Yahweh. He raises his hand against the throne of Yahweh. He takes any and every opportunity to attack Yahweh's people for absolutely no reason. His strategy is to pick off and take out all the followers of Yahweh that are weary and worn out and consequently lagging behind. In other words, his strategy is to wear down, tire out, weaken, and pick off the people of Yahweh to keep them from their promised destiny. Somehow, no matter what you do, strike him, drive him, drive him out, ignore him, forget him, Yahweh is eternally here a reconcilable enemy always bounces back when Yahweh's people least expect him. And last, the war of Yahweh and his people with this evil is from generation to generation. The past four chapters, 22 through 25, in particular, elaborate on Yahweh's passion for justice for the poor, the weak, and the despised. The people of Israel are the people of Yahweh. As such, they were called to live out that relationship in radically counter-cultural ways. They were to serve as a paradigm for the rest of humanity, demonstrating to a watching world what it means to be the people of Yahweh. So why conclude four chapters that are entirely devoted to the marginalized of society and to justice in general and within a social construct? with seemingly unrelated commandments. Remember what Amalek did to you on the journey when you went out from Egypt, that he met you on the journey and attacked you, all those lagging behind you, and when you were weary and worn out and he did not fear God. And when Yahweh your God gives rest to you from all your enemies from around about you in the land that Yahweh your God is giving to you as an inheritance to take possession of it, you shall blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under the heaven. You shall not forget. What do these verses have in common with the previous myriad of commandments all focused on protecting and honoring the dignity of society's most vulnerable and weak groups? As demonstrated in the previous slides, Amalek is more than just a physical enemy. Amalek represents a spiritual principality power slash power that operated through that tribe. Remember that principalities and powers are not just relegated to individuals. These beings cover territories. The Hebrew root for Amalek is Amal, which means to toil. Wearing effect, pain, wickedness, sorrow, wearisome, trouble, etc. In Exodus 17, the tiredness Moses felt was not just a natural tiredness. Moses was feeling the spiritual effect of this principality. The battle at Rephidim was first and foremost spiritual warfare. At Rephidim, this spirit was after the weary, 
worn out and lagging behind. But also at the same time, it was trying to wear down Moses. So he would give up on his posture of intercession for Joshua and his army. So this principality strategy has always been the same. Attack all those who are weary, worn out and lagging behind. Those vulnerable and weak groups whom we are commanded by Yahweh to protect and honor their dignity. But far beyond this principality seeks to wear down and wear out the most devoted and obedient of Yahweh's warriors. Such was the case with Moses. Until they lose their posture of prayer and faith and subsequently start making wrong decisions and choices regarding their destiny and inheritance. This is the principality that goes after the most vulnerable and weak in Yahweh's camp, but also the principality that may turn some of the strongest and most devoted in Yahweh's camp to weak and feeble. So in the past four chapters, Yahweh commanded us to protect and take care of the marginalized, weak and feeble, as they are the most vulnerable to this principality. But no less important also to make sure we are always on guard, fully aware and ready to fight the spiritual principality that is also seeking to turn his mighty warriors into weak, feeble and disobedient. And let me finish with a passage that I couldn't, couldn't just not be reminded of from Ephesians. Finally, become strong in the Lord and in the might of his strength. Put on the full armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the stratagems of the devil. Because our struggle is not against blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the world rulers of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Because of this, take up the full armor of God in order that you may be able to resist in the evil day. And having done everything to stand, stand therefore girding your waist with truth and putting on the breastplate of righteousness and binding shoes under your feet with the preparation of the good news of peace in everything taking up the shield of faith with which you are able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one and receive the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of God that's great So I really get emotional talking about this because I feel the spirit of Amalek attacking us and wearing us down for the past few years, day after day, minute after minute, just looking up at the sky, looking down at what's going on. It's just like non-stop. Chapter 25, what we just covered. Any input, questions, thoughts to discuss? Open table, turn up your mic and let's talk. Hi, I'm Deborah. I've heard recently, and I just wondered what your thoughts were about the armor of protection from powers and principalities. It's been pointed out that is Roman armor, not a priesthood armor. Are you talking about in specifically in Ephesians mentioning this? Yes. In the context, it is talking about spiritual forces of wickedness in high places because of this take on the full armor of God. That's, to me, it sounds like a spiritual armor, but he, good. Yeah, and that's how I read it, the spiritual, like the faith, and like your armor is your faith and your obedience and perseverance in walking the way of yeah that's your armor that's what i'm seeing and yeah we have scriptures that talk about resist the devil and he will flee from you what does it mean to resist well if you do resist he will flee he it's like that it's like the kid that picks on you and he sees he can't get anywhere with you so then he just moves on to the next person and so in that kind of sense but uh, yeah i don't see this as as a roman armor in what i read that's my opinion because many times as we were just reading before that the scriptures will say something that has a 
spiritual meaning or a greater meaning than what it's just specifically talking about. And I think what you did with the Amalek thing and then tying it in with all of the other verses talking about the those who are the orphans, the widows, the ones lagging behind, the weak, all of that, as we talked about protecting them and also the positions of certain types of people and then how Amalek would go and pick them off and target them mm-hmm. and so forth. And that's why we are to be there as a body to assist each other and even to the point of a leader such as Moses. Moses was fighting a spiritual battle battle, and what did he need? He had two brothers come up and hold his arms up yes. to finish the battle. So we, we got to uplift each other. We got to support each other. We have to look out for that. We can't look out just for ourselves. If, there's so many scriptures that talk about us if we just if we are looking out just for ourselves then there's no there's nothing for us selfishness is definitely not one of the fruits of the spirit and it's one of the ones that we should not be portraying yeah so i just want to make a comment on what deborah was saying because i have heard i what i've heard about the armor of yahweh was more or less i've heard people attribute it to the high priest garments stating like attributing to is it the high priest duties going in with the feet of peace into the Holy of Holies and putting the helmet of salvation on where it's like Yahuwah's name on the forehead. Yeah. I just wanted to make a comment. Like I have heard people kind of attribute kind of things like that to the high priest in some ways, like in the helmet of salvation and then going into the prayer with the table of incense and stuff like that. I don't know whether how true or whatever that is, but I thought it was, it's interesting and I think we could attribute to looking to Yeshua as being a high priest and putting on the breastplate, which would have been the stones that were really powerful and stuff like that. I think that metaphorically I could see that. But I want to just make a couple comments on, sorry, Ruth. And I just love that story so much because when you think about Boaz, you think it shows you like what type of a righteous man he truly was yeah. in this act that he is was doing with Ruth because he, w- he knew that the relative was not going to have anything to do with her because she was a Moabite. And he knew that, but he was going for it and saying, okay, I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt. And I'm going to just say, she's, you get first dibs. And beget- he knew that they were just literally loathed. And and because of what he did and his righteousness of that, Yahuwah bless him and that. And, mm-hmm. and then you look on the flip side of that of ben Tamar and what Judah was doing, he was being like a scoundrel. And, and he was thinking that, Tamar was like killing all of his sons or something and when you look at who Judy was married to exactly and so then you think of okay and then he realized the errors of his way afterwards and said that she was more righteous than him but I I just thought those two stories were just really a really good parallel a righteous man to an unrighteous man but erred in his ways and then repented and came back to it and come clean yes yeah it's great to read in in scriptures where people make mistakes and then they truly repent mm. and change their way. And you see the change. It's not they keep doing it. And you see the change. And that's accounted for them for righteousness. And they're forgiven. And that's the great thing that I continuously read in the Torah and in the Tanakh. And it just supports what Yeshua's message was supporting. Yes. And I did want to add regarding the priest piece is who went out to the battles priests went out to the battles mm-hmm. they were like like out there like leading them so mm-hmm. they weren't just guys suited up in a oh, temple no, they no, were yes. pretty mighty and ferocious yes, they I were mean, warriors. look what Le- levi did levi, levi tribe of levi was a warrior tribe yeah but but when i read the visions maybe it's Sometimes I feel like an outsider, right? Because I wasn't traced on the New Testament. So when I read Ephesians, I think it's more symbolic yeah. rather than... So yeah. I hope I chose the right passage. So. Well, yeah, each of these things, he outlines it. It's spiritual. But we have to take these things as spiritual pieces and then how each one of those fit in our lives and what we are to do. And they're always going to be based on or around obedience faith, fidelity, perseverance, justice, compassion, all of those things, and fortitude in your walk. Because the enemy's going to try to wear you down. And just like Moses, Moses was getting wear, worn down, and he had people to help support him. And hopefully each and every one has someone to support you, whether locally or by phone, at least, or something to help and encourage each and every one of you. 
Yeah, I think that's a really great example of Moses because as, as much as we revere Moses as this really amazing spiritual leader and stuff that it just like you had said it shows you that even the most righteous or the people who we feel are the strongest or leading can get worn down and yes. I it, even walking the tour living in this world just like Rona had said that earlier we are getting worn down and I feel like even myself like when it just you're just being assaulted yes. at every turn and I like the translation that you used of Ephesians. I was going to ask you what translation that was, because when mine reading mine, it just has a little bit of different wordings. But I think the one that you used was had was a lot more powerful when it talked about the rulers of the world and the world forces of the leaders. I thought that was really powerful because we really are up against that in in our day and age right now and like you said at at every turn and you just feel so tired you're just like oh my gosh not another thing like I feel so tired of having to deal with this and you can I can feel spiritually a heaviness in this world like a severe oppression yeah yeah I agree with you so all of the English translation that we chose to use for this study is from the LEB it's the Lexham Bible. You get it on Logos. The, Logos is the one the doctor... Uh, Michael Heiser. Michael Heiser. S- works for supports. Belated. Just yeah, we just felt it. that was a good translation, a close literal translation. So we just stuck with that to make it simple and easy. Yeah, it's literally the closest. And you can see, I, I do mark sometimes in blue comments on the translation, on the portion where I see that they deviated, but it's just h- hardly nothing compared to other translations. So they are the closest. So this week, variants. So those of you that joined us a, a few minutes late, you missed... Um, the introduction that we provided regarding some of the changes that we are making to the format of the study. So this week we only deep dive, we did a deep dive only on the Torah. And so the variants that you are watching here, those counters, they're only for the Torah. And as you can see, I hardly found any variants whatsoever between the versions. Alexek said just one significant variant and then two somewhat significant and I mark them if you have any questions about it just let me know so pretty close versions and then we wanted to conclude today's study with reading a hymn for from the thanksgiving hymns that were recovered the dead sea scrolls this hymn used to be called 23 and now it's called hymn one Your Holy Spirit illuminates the dark places of the heart of your servant. With like the sun, I look to the covenants made by men, worthless. Only your truth shines, and those who love it are wise, and walk in the glow of your light. From darkness you raise hearts. Let light shine on your servant, your light is everlasting. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Yes, thank you for joining, and I hope you all are blessed with this study and reading.